Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our workers training tonight. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, leaders, pastors, overseers, and workers. Thank you for everyone here. We're asking, O oh Lord, that your spirit will reveal more to everyone in Jesus' name. Strengthen your people. Energize us for greater exploits in Jesus' name. That your work will prosper in our hands. Thank you for the confirmation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Proverbs chapter 27. And I'm reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to their hurts. It's talking to us as leaders, talking to us as who are shepherds, and shepherds are pastors, pastors are leaders. And it says, We have flocks, we have herds, there are sheep, there are lambs. And then, as you look at all of them together, it's a flock, and it's the flock of the Lord. And it says, We must be diligent to know the stage. Of the flocks. Number one, to be diligent. That means to be seriously concentrating on the work we have to do. And it says we're diligent in one thing, we want to know, we want to see, we want to have proper knowledge concerning each of the lambs and each of the sheep. And we're to know the state, we're to know the spiritual standing of every one, of each one in the flock. And it says, look well to thy flocks. As we come to the New Testament, the second passage in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, reading from verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, reading here from verse 28. It tells us in verse 28, it says, Take each therefore unto yourselves, when he says, uh, therefore, it's referring to what he had said earlier. What had he said earlier is said, wherefore, in verse 26, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. Why? For I have not shunned, I have not neglected to declare, to preach, to teach, to make plain unto you all the counsel of God. He had taught the whole counsel of God to the people. And as he called these leaders together, these leaders were to now take the work and do it the way Paul the Apostle had done it in their midst. And he said, if we're going to do that effectively, they will take heed unto themselves. That is, you as a leader, you take heed to your own personal life, you take heed to your own personal experiences, and then he goes on to say, and to all the flock, the flock. We met the flock in Proverbs chapter 27. And now we're meeting the flock again. And it says we need to be diligent to know the state of everyone in the flock. And we make sure that we're looking well to all the herds. And then he says over here, he's made us overseers. If the Holy Ghost who has made us overseers, we shall feed the church of God. What he called the flock in the other place and in the other point, the former part of the chapter of the verse is calling the church of God here, and he reminds us that that church was purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Tonight we're looking at the message, the ministry of discipling Christians and protecting the church, the ministry of discipling Christians and protecting uh, the church on the one hand we do follow up on the one hand we're discipling on the one hand we're feeding we're nurturing we're nursing we're establishing those new converts the christians on the other hand we're looking at the whole church according to verse 28 we're taking heed unto ourselves as leaders we're taking heed unto ourselves as preachers 
We're taking heed unto ourselves as leaders of the people of God and to all the flock, everyone in the flock, the young and the old, the boys and the girls and the adults, the fathers and the mothers, everyone associated with the church, assembly with the church. And it says in the church that the Holy Ghost has made us overseers were to feed that church. And it says that church is the one that is purchased by the blood of the Lamb. What is he telling us to do all this? Look at verse 29. It says, For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He mentions the flock again, because that should be our concentration. And it says, After my departure, which means after I separated from them physically. After it's gone to another place, after my departing, it might still be on earth. It might have gone to Philippi. I might uh, go from Eph Ephesus to uh, Colossae. might go to other places. He has departed from them, from that vicinity. And now after his departure, then grievous wolves will enter in, not sparing the flock. Then he says in verse 30 also, of your own self shall men arise, speaking for verse 6, to draw away disciples after them. It says there's another danger that within the flock, there will be people who have been leaders before. There will be people who have been, who have raised up, who have been raised up to the level of teachers and preachers and pastors and shepherds. But now, they want to have the members of the flock for themselves. They want to draw disciples away after them. And now he says in verse 31, Therefore watch and remember, that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone. Tell me what follows there. Night and day of tears. That means he didn't limit his own uh, ministry to uh, two days of the week, three days of the week. He says night and day. In the day he did it, in the night he did it. He was watching over the people. He talks about the Christian and he talks about the church. Again, the topic is the ministry of discipling Christians and protecting the church. Three things we're looking at. Number one. Our diligence in nurturing converted Christians. Our diligence in nurturing converted Christians. Number two, the destructiveness of networking with corrupting compromisers. There are people who have compromised the faith. There are people who have departed from the faith. There are people who themselves are falling into sin and they're not getting away from the sin. All they want to do now is to justify that sin and to justify that a terrible, corrupted, compromising life and then to teach other people and to scatter the flock and to confuse the flock. And it is destructive. It is counterproductive. If we network with them and we allow them, they're like wolves, they enter into the flock and we leave them alone or they rise up within the flock and they are causing a confusion and compromise and we leave them alone. The destructiveness of networking with corrupting corruptors. Point number three, our devotedness to, not, to nourishing a conquering church. Our church will be a conquering church, a militant church. A powerful church, a church that will not be scattered. I thought you'll say amen. amen. And a church that will not be destroyed in Jesus' name. Amen. Our devotedness to nurturing a conquering church. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one on the other side there. God bless you. Our diligence in nurturing converted Christians. We're coming back to Proverbs chapter 27 proverbs chapter 27 and here we're reading again from verse 23 it says be thou diligent it's like he's talking to one person thou yourself take the message as if this is just coming to you take the message as if the standing of the believer and the uh, strength of that new convert depends on you and you alone and you are diligent be diligent to know the state of thy flocks, not only of one convert, not only of two converts, of the flocks. That is, there's a church here, there's a church here, there's a church there. It's like he's talking to a group pastor. 
that is the group pastor has uh, to oversee this flock and this flock and that flock it's like he's talking to um, who we call a representative of the old uh, group in our city church it's like you have many churches uh, under your leadership and you are diligent to know the stage of thy flocks in the plural it's like he's talking to a reaching overseer it's like he's talking to a state overseer and he says there are many flocks under your supervision it's like he's talking to a mother in the lord it's like he's talking to a youth leader and he says all these uh, locations and all these uh, places they're under you and he says be thou diligent to know the state First of all, you have to know. If you don't know the need, how can you meet the need? If you know, don't know their challenges, how can you answer those challenges? If you don't know what they're going through, you never interact with them and you never see them. How do you know what they're going through without diligent? Then to know the state of thy flocks and look well, look well, look well, look well to thy flocks. As we talk about a follow-up, we really need to understand some definite things concerning our follow-up. But before that, let's come to the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother. You see, Paul the Apostle was not able to get everywhere because he evangelized quite a lot. He went to this city and that city and that city. And it was uh, impossible for him to follow up on everyone. Therefore, he sometimes sent other people to stand in for him, to represent him, uh, and then to know the state of the flocks over there. He says over here, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent. That Jesus said, I know that person is going to be diligent. If I were there, I'll be diligent. I will know the state of the flocks. I will know their spiritual experiences. I will know where they are standing. I will know where they are weak. I will strengthen them. And these fellow were proved to be diligent in many things. But now, much more diligent. You see that? The people we are sending forth are the people that are going to represent us must be as diligent as we are. Over a period of time, we have seen them. And now it even says we'll prove them to be now more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 15. Diligence. It tells us in chapter 12 of Hebrews and in verse 15, it says, looking diligently. As you are doing the follow-up, you are looking diligently about yourself, about your own personal life, and about the lives of the people you are following up. It says, uh, looking diligently, lest any root of, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You will not be a source of defilement. You will be a source of strengthening in Jesus' name. In Second Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, I'm reading from verse ten. It says, "Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence." You see that? You see that? Old Testament, without diligence; New Testament, without diligence. It says, "Give diligence to make out your calling and your election sure. For if ye do these things, it shall never fall." I said, "It shall never fall." Our diligence in follow-up must be scriptural. Scriptural. You see, there are people who just say follow-up, follow-up. And we're asking ourselves, what's follow-up? And who are the people we're following up? We're following up newborn babes in Christ. And uh, we've read in our Building the Body booklet about how the mothers will take care of their newborn babes. Have you ever thought that mothers don't nurse cherish or they don't nourish and they do not nurse they do not nurture dead babies the babies have to be alive before we say we're nurturing them before we say we're following up on them and before we say we're teaching them you cannot teach dead babies you cannot feed dead babies and you cannot develop 
dead babies they have to be alive and the same thing i follow up we need to understand there are people who say they are christians help me write the word christian i'm going to use the letters of the word christian there are people who say they are christians and then we we'll say we're following up on them we're following up on them and then we we'll say they're not responding and what's the matter with them they're not responding and we do follow up and then we we'll say sir look at uh, all that we're, di we're diligent and as we're diligent we we'll run after them we we'll teach them we we'll do this we we'll do this and yet they are not responding you know what the people you are to follow up are those who are truly born again the other people who are not born again you're not following up on them you're teaching them repentance you're teaching them, you're evangelizing them. You're telling them what it means to be born again until they become born again. Follow up has not started. The word C is for carnal. You see, there are people, they're not born again. They're only carnal. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 6. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because, because, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. No matter how you teach, no matter how you feed a dead baby, that feeding will not make that baby to come alive. If they are carnal, they are not born again yet, age, they are hypocritical. And if they are hypocritical, they are not born again yet, a born again child of God will not be hypocritical. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23 and i'm reading from verse 25 matthew chapter 23 we're reading from verse 25 this is the reason why many people say we're following up and yet they're not responding they're not responding because they're carnal they're not responding because they're hypocritical they have not repented they have not given their lives to the lord verse 25 matthew 23 want to use scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye may clean the outside of the cup of the and of the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess if they have not given their lives fully to the lord and they are not born again they have not repented outwardly they put on whatever they put on outwardly they remove whatever they remove outwardly they conform but inter internally they are not born again look at verse 28 even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity that's why the follow-up to throw to them is not yield any fruit are the reprobates you know you cannot follow up a reprobate person he has not repented he calls himself a christian look at what titus says in titus chapter one titus chapter one i'm reading from verse 16 titus chapter one verse 16 they profess that they know god but in works they deny him they are not born again if they are not born again and they are carnal that's for c and they are hypocritical that's for h and they are reprobate what are you following up who are you following up it says they profess that they know god but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and to every good work tell me out loud reprobates you cannot follow up on them what you can tell them is about repentance it's about being born again it's about turning around and taking the lord jesus christ as their personal savior i they are impenitent impenitent that means they don't know anything about repentance in fact sometimes it is the fault of the person saying is preaching the gospel to them it's not talking about repentance it's not talking about uh, being sorry for their sins it's just talking about god will bless you christ will bless you he will heal you he will do this to you it's okay if that is so then i believe what do you believe when you have not repented if they are in penitent they are not born again yet look at romans chapter 2 verse 5 romans chapter 2 verse 5 but after the hardness and impenitent heart treacherous up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and a revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Impenitent. That means unrepentant. And then as the sensual. 
the ascension they are totally of the flesh it tells us in jude chapter 1 verse 19 jude chapter 1 reading from verse 19 it says in verse 19 these be they who separate themselves let's come to church uh-uh i don't have my own church let's go for this let's go for revival no i don't want to you know go to any other meeting just becoming just becoming what you tell me is enough they separate themselves and then it says sensual having not the spirit having not the spirit they do not have the conviction of the spirit of god and they have not confessed their sins they have not been led to confession of their sins by the spirit of god and there is no conversion by the spirit of god they are sensual and if you say you are following up on them it's counterproductive it's a waste of time they must be born again before you can say you are following up on them t they're traditional traditional we're looking at uh, mark chapter 7 mark chapter 7 and i'm reading from verse 9 before we can say we're following up on people there must be this assurance they're not carnal they're not hypocritical they are not reprobates, they are not impenitent, they are not sensual, neither are they traditional. They have given their lives to the Lord. They are born again, they are children of God, and now we can follow up on them. Look at this, we are looking at Mark chapter 7, and I am reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 7, reading here from verse 9. It says in verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandments of God, that she may keep your own tradition. You see, they are so wedded to tradition, and they are so attached to tradition, and they are so affiliated with tradition. Whatever else you say, you are following up on them. It doesn't take any root. It doesn't have any meaning. Look at verse 13, making, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. If they are so traditional in the way they think, in the way they talk, in the way they view religion, there's no follow-up. You must preach to them the real gospel. I, they're ignorant. They're ignorant of the righteousness of God. Ignorant, totally ignorant on what it means to get to heaven and what it takes to get to heaven. They think their denomination will save them. They think their church will save them. And they think that infant baptism will save them. They think that, you know, they take communion. They think that will save them. And they think that, uh, you know, paying their pastor's due or whatever, they think that will save them. They are ignorant of the righteousness of God. They are not born again yet. If they are not born again, you cannot do follow-up. Follow-up begins at the point when people get born again. Because now they are babes in Christ. And as babes in Christ, you are able to follow up on them. Them. Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 10, verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is, uh, is that they might be saved. That is, for Israel, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, and for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. You see that? All these people will say, we're following up on them, we're following up on them. They do not understand the righteousness of the earth and the righteousness coming from Calvary that God demands from them. And it says, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about uh, uh, to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And then, uh, you know, see, tell me, I'm beginning from your know, war, Christian. See, what does that mean? H. And the R. I. S. T. I. A. Abominable. Abominable. If you go back to that same Titus, that Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 16 again, Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 16, it says, they profess that they know God. Oh, I'm a Christian already. You know, this is my denomination, and this is what I do. I do this twice in the week. I've been baptized as an infant. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him. Being, what's the next word there? abominable and disobedient unto every good work 
reprobate. You are following up on them, but if they die in that condition, not being born again, but only abominable, look at what the end will be. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. Don't follow up on abominable people. Preach to them. Let them see the error of their way. Let them see the defilement of their abomination. And let them see they are not acceptable in the sight of God. It is when they repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God will bear witness in their hearts, the children of God. And it is only at that point after they are really born again. And he said, how could I have been living like that before? It was so terrible. I can see it now. I was so dirty and so defiled. But thank God because of the grace of God which has appeared unto me. And now I'm born again. And it is only after that time follow up can start. We're looking at it. verse 8. It says about the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. And the, sorcerers, and the murderers and the allmongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters. And how many liars now? All last shall have their parts in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second. They come to verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into each into heaven any sin that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination and or makers a lie but they which are reaching in the Lamb's book of life and then in the nominal. Nominal. They're just Christians in name. Their nature is not Christian, not Christ like. Their thoughts, not Christ like. Their heart, not Christ like. Their behavior, not Christ like. Only in name, only in name. I am um, watching, you know, and then they mention the, the so called the Christian name. They are nominal. Look at Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, This thing says he that uh, has the seven spirits of God and the, and the seven stars, I know thy words that thou hast, tell me, a name that thou livest, tell me the rest. And art dead. Look at verse 17 there. In verse 17, because thou sayest, there's just word of mouth. Thou sayest, thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind. And naked. You see, these people, Jesus is standing out outside the door, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He has not entered into them. He has not been given chance to save them. And yet they say, nominally, I'm a Christian. All those people, you cannot follow up on them. You can only evangelize them. When people are born again, then you understand, now follow-up is going to start. And the follow-up, we're going to be diligent in nurturing converted Christians, not those who are carnal, not those who are hypocritical, not those who are reprobates, not those who are impenitent, not those who are sensual, not those who are traditional, not those who are ignorant of the righteousness of God, not those who are abominable, not those who are nominal. We, we follow up on real Christians. Now, when we say we are following up, what do you do? How do you follow up somebody? How do you disciple somebody? What are the things you are going to share with them and you, as you are going to them? What is it that you are going to emphasize? And you want to make sure that this is in place and then you can measure that. You can evaluate that. You can say, praise the Lord, I went to him. I know he's born again. I emphasize this and then I asked him and then he's responding to that and you measure the effectiveness of your follow-up. Once again, we're going to use the word, the, the letters of the word Christian. Because now we follow up, we care for them. 
as we follow up, we're encouraging them. As we follow up, we're nurturing them. As we follow up, we're teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We're discipling them, and then we make sure they're truly really born again. In the scriptural sense of discipleship, we nurture them on sea, commitment to the Lord, commitment to the Lord. And that's what we're doing. You say you are following up on somebody, and you are following up on them so that they are committed, completely committed unto the Lord. In John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 31. It says in verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That's why you want to follow up on them. To make, to make sure that they are disciples indeed. There's commitment to the Lord. There's commitment to the word of the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 23. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 23. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all that were purpose of heart, they were cleave unto the Lord. That's the purpose, that's the essence, and that's the progress, and that's the process of the follow-up. You want them to cleave to the Lord, not to depart from the Lord, not to look back again, not to compromise, and not to backslide, but to cleave to the Lord. See, commitment unto the Lord. Our age, holiness to the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. You know what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading here from verse 14. Our follow-up show, make sure we tell them of the essence of making heaven on the final day. What was the point of follow-up? You know, I've been spending my life on that individual. I've been spending my resources on that, uh, on that family. I've been spending my skill on those groups of people. But they're never holy. And if Christ comes, then I'm going to make it. And then you've wasted the whole of your resources and you've wasted your life. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It says, Follow peace with all men. Remember, be diligent to know the stage of thy flock. You know, that so and so offended me before I became born again. I wasn't greeting so and so. And before I came to know the Lord so and so, we're never in good terms together. But now you are born again. What are you teaching them? What are you reminding them of? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Where do you work? What do you do? What, how do you make your money? How do you trade? How do you do your marketing? And in all those areas, in their family life and everything, you're teaching them that there should be holiness unto the Lord, holiness in the presence of the Lord, because holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. What is C there? And what is H over there? R is recompense after life. After life, let them understand. You say you are following up on people. Let them understand there is either reward or there is a retribu retribution. There's, there's going to be recompense after life. Recompense after life. Because you see, they don't know that. Uh, some people have problems and they say, it is better to die than to live. And some people you hear, you know, you've been following up on them, following up on them. Uh, and then eventually you heard that they committed suicide. You didn't teach them of recompense after life. That if somebody takes his life, this is what is going to be the consequence. If you say you cannot endure this anymore, or you fall into, you know, whatever trial, tribulation, or temptation, they, are, they cannot endure, tell them that after life there is recompense. We're looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at um, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I uh, were reading from verse 6. It tells us over here in verse 6. It says, Seeing is a righteous thing with 
God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. They face persecution. Tell them not to worry about that. Leave that in the hands of God. The Lord will recompense them. If they repent, the Lord will save them. If they don't repent, there's recompense. And then it goes in verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's recompense after life. I identification with the Lord. Identification with the Lord. You cannot answer all the questions of those people you are following up. How do you help them in their personal lives? You tell them anything that comes to you. Anything you want to decide, ask yourself, what will Jesus do? That's all. What will Jesus do? Even as Jesus will act, that's how I should act. As Jesus will talk, that's how I should talk. As Jesus will interact, that's what how I should interact. What Jesus will drink, that's what I should drink. What Jesus will take, that's what I will take. And who Jesus will associate with, that's what I will associate with. Tell them the importance of these two words, even as even as you're a Christian, he is Christ. Christian, even as Christ. Christian, talking, even as Christ. Living, even as Christ. We call that identification. Identification. We're coming to John. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading here from verse 16. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 16. Are you there now? Okay, if you are there, read it out aloud. It's like you want to sleep, and I'm troubling you, I'm preaching to you. One, two, three, go. I want you to understand those two words, even as, even as. Here is Jesus talking. He said, they are born again. They identify with me. They are like me because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 1. We're searching for the word, even as, even as. Tell those new converts, tell those babes in Christ, even as Christ. Identification with Christ in uh, First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 be ye followers together of me tell me what follows even as I am also of Christ even as identification identification with Christ we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 reading from verse 32 it says and be kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another tell me what follows even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That helps you. As you are following up on them, you remind them, even as Christ. Even as Christ. Even as Christ. Somebody has offended you. And can I forgive this person? You forgive, even as Christ has forgiven you. And then I want you to dress a particular way. What will you tell me? How do I dress? Well, even as, even as. Christ will not dress to tempt other people, to make other people fall, and to do anything naughty and anything unreasonable, even as, and somebody has done something to me, I feel like I should, you know, take it back on him, because if I don't do that, he'll do that again, remind them, even as, as Christ, it is that identification, if they really understood that, that will make them to live the Christian life. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 13. Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Tell me what follows. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, even as. Somebody tell me, even as. How am I to live? How are you to live? How are we to relate with each other? 
even as even as Christ for Christ even as Christ has done we're looking at first John chapter 2 first John chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 6 always ask yourself what will Christ do what will Christ do how will Christ act how will Christ respond how will Christ react to that even as we're looking at first John chapter 2 verse 6 he that says he abideth in, in him ought himself so to uh, also so to walk tell me even as he walked you see it all over the bible even as look at chapter 3 verse 3 chapter 3 verse 3 it says in chapter 3 verse 3 and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself tell me even as he even as he is, he is pure. And now we're coming to Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Tell me, even as also I overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. See, commitment to the Lord. Age, holiness of life to the Lord. And our recompense after life, I identification with the Lord is separation from the world. That's what we are teaching them. If you say you are following up on the people and they, you know, the worldliness, and they don't know about worldliness, but it says in this uh, thing, what they will say we're being followed up, there must be separation from the world. We're coming to Second Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 16. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, tell me, come out from among them and tell me, be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I will, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Can I go to the nightclub? Be you separate, says the Lord. Can I join Pan Wine, uh, Pan Wine Drinkers Club? Uh, be you separate, says the Lord. You read it to them. Can I belong to a guy? Can I belong to a cult? Uh, you know, in our church where I was going before, they didn't mind even if I belong to a cult, and you didn't mind if I belong to that society or that society. What's the Lord saying? The follow up we're doing must show that we're telling them number one, commitment to the Lord, number two, holiness unto the Lord, number three, there's recompense of afterlife, number four, there's identification with the Lord, and then is there is separation from the world. It tells us in James chapter one, James chapter one. One, and here we're reading from verse 27. James chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world and so if we're doing follow up and these people are still part of the world they think like what they talk like the world and they're polluted like the world that follow up is not effective in james chapter 4 verse 4 ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with god whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is enmity is an enemy is the enemy of god we must teach them separation from the world t the truth the truth you see all that they knew in religion was error all that they were following after in religion was to teach them and you are going to follow up on them you are going to disciple them T, that's the truth. We're looking at John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. Uh, read it to me. One, two, three, go. I caught you. I caught you. John chapter 8, verse 32. Open it and read. Are you ready now? One, two, three, go. 
if we want them to be free, they need to know the truth. You are following up on people, and they have a lot of things binding them. They have some traditions binding them, and they have some opinions binding them, and they have some a kind of a superstition binding them, and they have some things in their past and their families binding them, and you want them to be free. It is not, you know, I pray for you, I break this, I destroy this, I cast this one out. That will only help temporarily. But when you make sure that they know the truth, and they come to the light of the truth of the word of God, all those things binding them will vanish away in Jesus' name. And ye shall know the truth. Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. They will be free in Jesus' name. And we don't ever co compromise with the truth. I inheritance inheritance when you deep follow up let them know what they have let them know what they have as inheritance in the lord let them know what they have as their possession in the lord in acts of the apostles chapter 20 verse 32 acts of the apostles chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 32 it says in verse 32 and now brethren i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified they need to know what their inheritance is because i'm in christ i have this because i'm in christ i possess that because i'm in christ this is mine they must know their inheritance a access to the lord access to the lord you see many times uh, they will, uh, the new converts will like to just depend on you and they do not know they have direct access unto the lord by themselves and there are some people that nurture and they nourish that kind of dependency they cannot pray without coming to you they cannot get anything without coming to you they cannot read the bible without coming to you and then you tell them something you say you know when a baby is born just like we're read in our nose when a babe is born he cannot do anything for himself he has to depend totally on the mother for the little babe that's true the little babe has not you know been in the world before therefore he doesn't have to drink water by himself but you don't teach a babe how to drink put the bottle in his mouth he'll drink you don't have to teach him that put the milk there he will drink and then there are things he can do by himself but there are people you know if you have any challenge i'm a prayer warrior i can pray for you let them depend upon the very fact that now i'm born again i'm a child of god i have access to the lord and look at this is telling us in romans chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 2 access to the lord give them confidence that they can approach the lord by themselves it says in romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ look at this look at this by whom also we have what do we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. They have access to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 Ephesians chapter 2 and here we're reading from verse 18. It tells us in verse 18 it says for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. We have access unto the father and it says ask it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock it shall be opened unto you because you have access unto the father in newness of life newness of life now you are born again now you are a child of god what are you doing about follow up you are following them also they will know what's the life they're going to live now and they're to live in newness of life we're looking at romans chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 4 romans chapter 6 we're looking at verse 4 it says in verse 4 therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of the father even so we should walk how in newness of life in newness of life if any man be in christ tell me as a new creature tell me what follows all things are passed away and behold what 
All things have become new. So, as we say we're doing follow up, we use the word Christian. If they're born again, then they're Christians. And we make sure that we're telling them and teaching them and nurturing them and nourishing them, establishing them in commitment to the Lord, in holiness of life, in recompense after life, identification with the Lord, separation from the world in the truth, inheritance, access unto the Lord, and the newness of life. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 29. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 29. We'll come to point number two now. The destructiveness of networking with corrupting compromisers. Corrupting compromisers. We'll come to Acts, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 29. It says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The Spirit of God has expressly warned of grievous wolves entering in from the outside. And what do they come to do? They come to deceive. They come to confuse. They come to destroy. They come to weaken the flock. They come to scatter the flock. They come to drive away the flock. They want to drive the flock, those new, uh, new converts, into damnation. And shepherds are to be watchful. Shepherds are to be watchful. Look at verse 30. In verse 30 it says, And also of your, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to do what? I said to do what? To draw away disciples after them. The church is also warned of perverted, ambitious, false teachers from within the fold who will attempt to draw away disciples after themselves. These are perverted deceivers and they use number one, forceful personality. They have a strong personality. And they come to these people and they say, I'm telling you, I'm starting something new. Follow me. And it's threatening them because they have a forceful personality. Number two, they use false promises. You know, as you are here, there's so many. Look at the congregation over here. There's so many. They don't know you, but you come. You come. And then we will we'll give you this. Number one, forceful personality. Number two, false promises. Number three, they use fervent prayers, but faithless prayers. They say, we'll pray for people, we'll pray for people, we'll pray for you. If you don't have, you don't have to pray by yourself. They won't allow the people to learn how to pray by themselves. We'll pray for you. You'll have this, you'll have this. Fervent, frequent prayers, but faithless prayers. They use financial prosperity. They say, you know, the economy at this time, and you know the church, uh, deeper life, they're only talking about heaven, about rapture, and they're talking about holiness, they're talking about this and that. But you know, we need, what are we going to eat? We must eat. Okay, those of us in deeper life, we're not eating. How many of you have eaten today? I said, have you eaten today? They talk as if we don't have clothes to wear, as if we don't have food to eat, as if we don't have any work to do. They talk as if we're only talking about holiness, holiness. Yes, we're talking about holiness, but how many of you are happy? Do you have happiness? Do you have joy? Do you have family? Do you have provision? Are you paying school fees for your children? Are you paying house rent? They talk as if deeper life, we don't talk about any other thing, only this and that. But thank God we have everything. I have everything. But you know, they use, uh, they, they deceive the people with financial prosperity. Not only that, they use fleshly permissiveness. Permissiveness. They say over here, here is a land of no law. Here is a land of no regulation. You can do anything, you can go anywhere, whatever. You do. We don't mind over here. You use this, you drink that, and you go to a nightclub, and you go to whatever you go to. Just come to church on Sunday, and let us just worship together, and fellowship together. We don't care what you do during the week. They use fleshly permissiveness. Then they use a fake frightening prophecies. They use prophecy. They say, you know, 
I saw something. It is not a dream. And, you know, ask our people over here because here we have prophets. And when we prophesy and we say this and we say this, it's exactly to the letter. It is fake. I said it is fake. Nobody will draw you away with fake prophecies in Jesus' name. And then they use feeble persuasion. Feeble persuasion. You see, the people who are not thinking, you know, they're the people that follow what they're doing. But, you know, when you analyze the persuasive thing they're trying to say, it hasn't, it hasn't got any root. And it doesn't have any taproot at all. That's why the Lord is warning us that we will not allow any of those things to sway and to drive away our converts in Jesus' name. They only drive them away and they drop them and those unstable souls to hell to perdition and to eternal suffering that's why the lord is saying be warned i'm coming to verse 31 therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years i cease not to warn everyone night and day with what with tears is telling us that every christian leader and the whole church uh, should remember the teaching of the word of God. We shall remember the truth. We shall remember the tears of the preachers, the trials of the preachers like Paul, the travail of the preachers like Paul, the toiling of the preachers like Paul. We shall remember their troubles. We shall remember their travelings. We shall remember their tribulation, their temptation. Paul, the apostle, said, as you look at all the other passages of scripture concerning Paul, the apostle, he said he had many tears for the people. He's gone through troubles for the people. He said, you know, our temptation, trial, and tribulation. He says, you know, our travail, I will travail over you night and day so that you will not be lost. Three things we're looking at. Number one, watch against corruptors. Watch against corruptors. Look at verse 29. It says, For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Watch against corruptors. Number two, one against compromisers. One against compromisers. In verse 30 also, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Number three, weep over the corrupted or the condemned. Some people are corrupted already. Some people have fallen already. And some people have compromised already and they are condemned. Weep over the corrupted. Number one, what's number one then? Watch against the corruptors. We're coming to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Paul the Apostle spoke about these grievous wolves, and then Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, spoke about them, and he tells us in Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse, um, reading from verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, what, what are they? There are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. You'll bring forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I pray that will not be your Lord. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, they may come into your congregation, they may come into assembly, and they know to call Jesus, oh Jesus, and they know to call God Almighty, they know to say hallelujah, they know to say Lord, Lord, it says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Look at this, or oh, the first one in verse 22. I said, what's the first word in verse 22? 
and look up here for a moment you know when we read the word of this is the word of god this is the bible some people will say you know they talk as if they're the only righteous people we didn't say that but the lord jesus said many are people who are deceptive many are the people who are destructive many are the people who are just coming to our converse and we're doing the evangelism are you going to you know give back to a child and then give it to the hands of a robber and give it to the hands of a somebody who does not know left from right who did not know the labor pains so went through before that child was born we must be reasonable we're telling our own converse we're telling let them win their own converse let them run out their own converse why would they be running after our own church members why would they be running after our own converse that we labored over we know the truth do you know the truth yes. anybody know the truth there yes. praise the lord we know the truth and we're telling the people the truth and jesus said many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not what did they do prophesied in thy name uh -uh. and then in thy name have we done what cast out devils and in thy name have we done many wonderful works then will i profess unto them what were they born again were they children of god were they true servants of god why will you give your child to somebody who is not a true child of God, a not a true man of God? Why will you give yourself somebody, you know, your own convert and say, well, it doesn't really matter. If they come to deeper life, all right. If they don't come and they go to the other place, what do you know they're going to teach them in the other place? Because Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that walk in equity. Number two, he tells us to warn the compromisers. Warn the compromisers. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. Galatians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 6. Warn the compromisers. In Galatians 1 verse 6, it says, I marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul the apostle had come to the Galatians. He preached the word unto them. And he came to know the Lord. And there were these people now that came from the inside. And I was saying actually what Paul the apostle preached is not complete. Except you are circumcised. And then except you follow the Jewish law. And you follow the sabbatical law. You cannot really be saved. That's why he said. And some of them accepted. Some of them followed. And Paul the apostle said I marvel. I'm surprised, I'm shocked that ye are so soon removed from him that called you. Was I not with you a few weeks ago? A few months ago, I'm surprised. I'm hearing about you that now you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another in verse 7. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Tell me, let him be a cause. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have received, tell me. Let him be a cause. Number one, watch against the corruptors. Number two, one, against the compromisers. Number three, weep over the corrupted. Weep over the corrupted. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 18. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. For many walk of whom I've told you often, and now tell you, even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of christ whose end is their is destruction are they going to be saved are they going to heaven whose god is their belly whose whose glory is in their shame what do they do oh mind as things. it says we should weep over such people we're coming back to acts of the apostles point number three now acts of the apostles chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 28 and verse 32 acts of the apostles 
chapter 20. We're reading from verse 28. In verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves. Therefore, because of all these that we have heard, and because of the danger in front or before those new converts, if we do not follow properly, and we do not teach them step by step, systematically, what we ought to teach them, and they are not totally committed to the Lord, then there will be loss in their lives. There's danger. Therefore, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of the of god what are we to do to the church church tell me let the leaders who know tell me feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood look at verse 32 and now brethren i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up this word will build them up it's been you it's been you up already are you built up? Yeah. I said, are you built up? Yeah. You will not fall. Yeah. You will not shake. Yeah. You will not compromise. Yeah. You will stand. Yeah. How many of you know you can stand? That the grace of God is sufficient for you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You'll be like the rock of Gibraltar. Yeah. It says to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The Lord will give you an inheritance. Point number three, our devotedness to nourishing a conquering church. Our devotedness to nourishing a conquering church. What are we to do? Number one, feed the church. Number one, tell me. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. John chapter 21, John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they are dying, Jesus says unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, Lord, that knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Tell me, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. Those lambs, those new converts, they just come into the kingdom. Feed them, feed them. Look at verse 16. He says to him, Again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, that knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Tell me, feed my sheep. Have you noticed? Feed my lambs, the little ones. You see, in the children's church, we thank God for our children's church teachers and leaders. They're feeding those lambs. They're feeding those little children. And those little children, they know about salvation. They know about holiness. They know about restitution. They know about sanctification. They know the word of God. They know that Jesus is coming back again because they're feeding the lambs. And in the adult church, thank God, we know the truth. We're feeding the adult church for the word of God. Look at verse, 20, verse 17. It says to him, the third time, Simon, son of Jude, Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he saith unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Anybody loving the Lord over here? I said anybody loving the Lord over here? What's the Lord telling you if you love the Lord? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Number one, feed the church. Number two, teach the church teach the church it's not every time we just tell stories and illustrations and then we're preaching preaching is good but it's teaching there's teaching we're coming to acts of the apostles chapter 11 verse 26 acts of the apostles chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 26 it tells us in verse 26 acts 11 it says when you had found him and he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. They assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Teach the church. Number three, multiply the church. 
multiply the church. It's not just that you have a little congregation. Praise the Lord, we are the faithful few. Praise the Lord, we are the faithful few. Or we were 13 last week. Thank God, one, two, three, we are 13 this week. And then when we come again, the following, we are still 13. We are faithful, we are faithful. We are not backsliding. Multiply, grow. We are looking at uh, chapter 9, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then uh, at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. They were multiplied. Multiply the church. Number four, equip the church. Equip the church. As uh, local churches are being raised up, we're evangelizing there, we're following up there. Give them leaders, give them pastors, give them shepherds, so that the church will be well equipped. We're coming to chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, we're reading from verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must throw much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, elders in every church, ordain, appoint, equip, and train, and engage elders in every church, and they had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believe. Number five, Establish the church. Establish the church. We come to chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. Chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. And they went, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem and so were the churches established in the faith what they got from Jerusalem the headquarters they gave to all the other branch churches and as they went they gave as they went they gave you know at that time there was no radio there was no television there was no internet at that time there was no streaming and there was no transmission and therefore they have to go by foot and they have to go one after the other and they delivered unto them the word of God from the headquarters but thank God today there's transmission thank God today there's streaming thank God today there's radio television and you know all the gadgets will use social media and I pray we'll use them more effectively in Jesus name and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number how often daily number six build the church build the church we're building them up the members of the church and we're also having good buildings for them where they can uh, fellowship and worship build the church first corinthians chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 9 first corinthians chapter 3 we're reading from verse 9 for we are laborers together with god ye are god's husbandry ye are god's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and uh, a yet and another buildeth thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon others are building you join along and we're building together I said we're building together number seven serve the church serve the church Without any uh, kind of selfishness, serve the church. It tells us in um, it tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter eleven. Acts of the Apostles, chapter eleven. I'm reading from verse twenty-one. Acts chapter eleven. Reading from verse twenty-one. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then the tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which is at Jerusalem, that's the headquarters, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. You see, Peter 
was not traveling all the time alone and uh, john and james and the other apostles there were other people and these people were in the headquarters church and something's going on and talk barnabas you go there and was ready to serve and thank god in our church we are people who are ready to serve i'm looking at them i said where people who are ready to serve and if you are to go to you know that place and that place and that other place you'll serve the church in jesus name give me a good amen for assurance Verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all that with, the, with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man. And we have a lot of those good men, good women in the house today. And I pray you will not be idle. Yeah. You will serve the church. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the lord through you many will be added unto the church number eight protect the church protect the church grievous wolves will try to come in protect the church some people will try to rise up and they will want to pervert uh, the church of the living god protect the church galatians chapter 2 in galatians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 4 Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we give space by, by subjection, no not for an hour you know people came in they wanted to sow their seed of deception and the seed of false doctrine and it says we give them no no submission no attention no not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you the truth will continue with you number one feed the church number two teach the church Number three, multiply the church. Number four, equip the church. Number five, establish the church. Number six, build the church. Number seven, tell me, serve the church. Number eight, protect the church. Number nine, edify the church. Edify the church. Whatever you're doing in ministry, as you minister to the people of God, edify, edify. Let that be the watchword in your life, in your ministry, edify the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye as zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek that she may excel to the edifying of the church. Number nine, number ten, prepare the church for the Lord. Prepare the church for the Lord. The Lord is coming. And you want to present the church unto the Lord, sanctified and holy and pure. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, whom we preach, Somebody they say, preacher, you will preach. I said, you will preach. Who will preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man how perfect in Christ Jesus. Number 11, strengthen the church. You will not weaken the church, you will strengthen the church. You'll, make, you'll not make the church to fall. You'll make the church to stand firm in Jesus' name. Strengthen the church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he, that um, has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou Hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Watch over the church. 
be diligent to know the stage of thy flock and look well unto thy herds. And you see those who are backsliding, raise them up. Those who are not born again, minister unto them. And those who are weak, strengthen them, strengthen the church. And it says, be watchful and strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a sieve, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. You will watch. Number 12, purify the church, purge the church, perfect the church for the coming of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that ye might present ye to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Look up here for a moment. You have a moderate congregation. And he has a moderate congregation. If each one will be watchful, if each one will be faithful to make sure that the people in this, our local congregation, they're saved, they're sanctified, they're strengthened, they're sustained by the grace of God, and they're living right. And we follow up on each of them, not only on the newcomers, on all the members. How are you doing? Are you having a fellowship with the Lord? Are you standing? Are you by the grace of God glorifying God? And we're watching over every member in those little, little flocks. An area leader is doing that. A leader is doing that. A coordinator is doing that. And then we, those of us who are overseers, we're visiting the local churches. And those of us who are group pastors, we're visiting. And when we visit, we're not just there to make them laugh or to entertain them. We're following up on them. We love them. We feed them with the word of God. If this one is perfected, that one is perfected, that one is perfected, the whole church will be perfected. Yeah. You will be faithful. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Am I talking to you? Yeah. Are you going to do it? Yeah. You will feed the church. Yeah. You will teach the church. Yeah. You will multiply the church. Yeah. You will equip the church. Yeah. You will establish the church. Yeah. Don't let your amen die in your mouth. You will build the church. You will serve the church. You will protect the church. You will edify the church. You will prepare the church for the rapture. You will strengthen that local church. You will purge. You will purify. You will perfect the church. The grace of God is sufficient for you. Paul did it by grace. Peter did it by grace. Some of us are doing it by grace. You'll find God's grace abounding, abiding in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's end up by looking at Proverbs chapter 27 and reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 27, reading from verse 23. Be thou diligent to know, to know the state, the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy hearts and everything the Lord has given you to do the power, the courage the backbone, the authority the anointing to do will overflow in your life Amen. let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer let's pray that the Lord will help us that we will disciple Christians will protect as well as multiply the church of the living God